There we go. There we go. There we go. All right. All right. Can you guys hear me? All right. He won't fail me now. He hasn't failed in the past. He won't fail now. He won't fail in the future because he can't fail. He just can't. He doesn't have the ability to fail. That's a human attribute. That's not his attribute. That's why when you receive Jesus, he makes you more than a conqueror because Jesus, God, is a conqueror. You can't have Jesus and follow him without him leading you to victory, breakthrough, and overcoming what's been overcoming you. And... When I say overcoming us or overcoming you, it's, it's, it could be depressions overcoming you. It could be your past sins and shame overcoming you. It could have been an abuse that you went through that you've never been the same before. It could be an addiction to a drug or alcohol and you can't kick it. Or it could be a lifestyle that you're struggling with and you're saying, I've tried to overcome it. I couldn't overcome it. I tried the counseling. I tried the programs. I, I tried to kick the anxiety. I, I've, I've, I'm taking the pills, but I'm still struggling. I got good news for you. What they can't do, what he can't do, what she can't do, Jesus could do. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand for your own victory in Christ. Lifestyle change. Come on. God could change your life, your family, your emotions, your future, and it could happen today. We're lifting up the name of Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit is here to transform your life. Be open to hear truth and receive it. Um, ladies Conference coming up next week. I myself, I myself am getting prepared. I'm going to be speaking, and it's going to be, it's going to be a word that's going to change your life. When I seek after God for a special conference, I'm just going to hear from God. You're going to get a word from God. I... I'm replacing Sarah Jakes. I want you to understand. If God put me, took Sarah Jakes out and put me in, is because you need to hear a word from your pastor. Come on, ladies. I got a word for you. Don't miss it. Oh, man, I wish Sarah Jakes was here. She's not supposed to be here. Stop, being, stop worshiping personalities and depend on the power of the Holy Spirit and show up. We need to be fans of Jesus. Come on, let's give the Lord. Come on, Jesus. Lift up the name of Jesus. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what you need. Right? So get ready. Uh, I, myself, and, you know, yesterday I was at, at my house, and we had, a, we had a house on movement that actually Gabriel's moving out of. And then I got, I got actually, some of you guys don't know, but um, Gavin Tate and Ashley Tate are going to become part of our church. They're here. They're going to be here. They're going to be part of our staff. So they're here, and they're moving into my house. And we had a cleaning crew cleaning up. And as soon as I walked in, I seen a, I seen a young lady cleaning. And I, I, I don't know. I just went straight after her to tell her about Jesus. Come on. I went straight after her. I just said, and I just asked her, just a quick question. You go to church? She goes, uh, nah. And she was, like, startled. Like, why are you asking me that question? And I told her, I told her, well, I told her, there's a God that loves you. He has a plan for your life. He wants to set you free. He, and she just, as soon as I said that, she just started crying. She goes, I can't believe you're talking to me. I've been overwhelmed. I've been full of anxiety. And right now I feel like, I feel like goosebumps. God, she has began to cry. She surrendered her life to Jesus. She's going to be here this Sunday with her kids. And I told her this. I told her this. I'm buying you a ticket for the women's conference. And she goes, you mean it's going to be all ladies? I go, yep. She goes, I'm going to be there. I go, are you going to come? She goes, I'll be there. There's another young lady I met at a funeral. I, I, she's been overwhelmed, single mama. I'm, I'm buying her a ticket too. I'm just doing my part to fill that, that. Come on, these ladies, come on, understand, not only you buy, you get there, buy someone else's a ticket. Come on. Be more than an overcomer. You show up, you're overcoming. You bring someone else, you're more than overcoming. Come on, give God some praise. God, get it ready. Don't miss it. 
God says, Sarah Jakes, no. Marco, yes. I go, okay, let's do this. All right. Today we're going to be talking to continue talking about end times. And we're talking about abortion. And we're wondering, is, is this an end time, an end time sign? Is it part of the end times? And we're going to cover what the Bible says about abortion, what science says about abortion. And you're going to see how, how this abortion thing is not something that was, that was just invented uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago. It was invented in history. And we'll even go through the history of where they started this whole thing about dedicating babies to gods. We're going to cover that today. So it's going to be interesting. Take your notes. I'm going to try to get through as much as I can today. Lord, help me because I want you to get all this information today. And we're going to develop this. And we're going to equip you to be able to help people, get set free, make sound decisions, understand this, and be able to defend your faith according to Scripture. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this time we have together. And everyone that's here for the first time. I ask you, Lord, to help them feel really welcome and loved as we reach out to them with love and that they will recognize that this is a place of new beginnings, hope. This is a place of freedom. This is a place of healing. This is a place of emotional wholeness that we find in you. I thank you, Lord. You said whoever calls upon your name will be saved, to be made whole, to be set free, to have a new life. May we open our minds and our hearts to you today. And believers... We pray right now as believers that we'll hear your word, transform our life, get revelation, that we'll apply it, we'll walk in truth, we'll walk in love, we'll walk in victory, and we'll flow to reach other people with your love and your truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This is a relevant subject, obviously. There's been an over, overturning of Roe versus Wade. Um, it, that, that, the, the overturning of Roe versus Wade did not... It did not end abortion. It just brought it from the federal level to the state level. And what they're saying is each state will vote on whether, what, whether they make abortion legal or illegal or what levels of abortion will be allowed in each state. This is a, it's a crucial time because no one ever thought that, that we would be a post Roe versus Wade society or, or America, and we are. And there's going to be a lot of states that actually make it totally 100% illegal. We're going to discover whether they should or not. And we're going to discover really is abortion really murder? Is it wrong? We're going to find out what the Bible says about it. I, again, I am not here to be dogmatic about any subject. We go through scripture. We learn it. We hear what God says and we adjust our lives to it. You could believe it or not. But I do know this. If you believe the word and you apply the word, you get the, re the results of the word. It's never to hurt you. But there's a promise in the last days that there would be an apostasy and abortion. Let's just see this. In 2 Thessalonians 2.3, which is a foundational scripture, it says this, that day will not come. That day before Jesus Christ comes back, it's coming. The day of judgment is in the future. But that day will not come before there arises a definite rejection of God. That there would be a society that no longer wants God. They don't want prayer. They don't want, they don't want to hear about the Bible. They don't want to hear preaching. Could we be in that society today? We used to be a Judeo-Christian nation. And we're really a post-Judeo-Christian nation now. The majority of people do not believe in God. That's who we're running towards. They don't attend church, and they don't want to hear nothing about God. They want to be their own gods and define their own morals and more, their own values as well. It's not working out for us. We're more depressed than ever. We're more anxious than ever. Our families are falling apart. Our relationships are falling apart. We don't even know who we are. Uh, we're having gender issues, identity issues. We're confused. When we do it our way, we don't get God's results. We do it God's way, we get the blessed results. Blessed means happy. It means whole. It means victory. To reject God, so there's going to be a time where they'll reject God, definite rejection of God. You'll see it. To reject God is to reject his word by not believing in it and obeying it. You could reject God without saying, I reject God. 
You can reject God by just not believing in the Bible and not obeying the Bible. If there's a church that's twisting scripture and they're actually editing the Bible, these are rejectors of God. You cannot believe and believe this statement that the Bible was written by men, therefore it has errors. Because at that point, you're under an error. It was inspired by God, it's breathed by God, and every single sentence, every single comma, every single period was put there by God, and it's truth to build our lives on. When we come to hear the Word of God, we come to adjust our lives to the Word of God, and every time you hear the Word of God, you can receive it or you can reject it. You do have that option. If you receive it, you'll receive the blessings of that word. If you reject it, you'll get the curse of that word. Be hearing the word of God is very important. Responding to the word of God is even more important. Because after you leave here, either you're moving toward a blessed life or you're moving towards a cursed life. Either you're moving towards a harvest or you're moving towards a decrease. So why is there going to be a definite rejection of God in the last days? Why? Why would people reject God? This is the reason. Answer. People will love, be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Pleasure will be the God of the day. In 2 Timothy 3, 2 and 4, it says, 3, 2 and 4 says, remember this. There, there are some terrible, or it means distress, great physical pain, suffering, sorrow, danger, Time's coming in the last days. There's going to be some terrible, distressful, sorrowful days in the last days. Why? People will love only themselves and their money. What will you sacrifice for yourself and your money? The abortion business, I'm going to kind of put something in front. The abortion business is a big business. It's around a $2.5 billion industry. There's abortionists that call themselves Christians, but they will not stop doing abortions because this is how they make money. So they love their money more than they love God. Be careful who and what you're sacrificing for your money and your pleasure. Because every single pleasure will come with a sacrifice. You cannot indulge in demonic pleasure, sinful pleasure, without the devil demanding a sacrifice from you. Sacrifice your health. Sacrifice your wealth. Sacrifice your family. Sacrifice your future. Sacrifice your job. Sacrifice your kids. But understand, sin will demand a sacrifice. And we have to ask ourselves, what have I sacrificed for my pleasure? Look at this. Instead of loving God, they will love what? Pleasure. Instead of loving God, they will love insight. There's only two groups of people in God's sight. Lovers of pleasure and lovers of God, one or the other. Either we're living for the weekend and pleasure or you're living for God. You're in one group or the other. That makes it very simple. Lovers of pleasure. A Greek word means philodonis. Say it with me, philodonis. It means lovers of lust. Lovers of sexual and sensual desires. Lovers of pornography. Lovers of the flesh and the world. We are living in a porn society. Porn industry is a $12.5 billion yearly industry. Thousands upon tens of thousands of websites. Porn is easier to get than ever. Why? We are living in a society that loves pleasure. And I want you to buckle in, 
handle this message. Let God do some surgery on you. I know it's hard because we're living in a world that loves pleasure and your God is telling you, get up, walk out, and you got to tell, no, I'm going to listen. Because when pleasure rules you, it speaks to you. It's a God. It has a voice. And it wants to own you. Lovers of pleasure. Lovers of sex. Or lovers of God. Lovers of God is philotheos. It means worshipers of God. It means those who are devoted to God. Those who are obedient to God's commands. Friends of God. Pleasers of God. It is only our love for God that causes us to say no to the sensual desires of the flesh so that we can obey God. Unless you love God more than you love the sensual desires of your flesh, you'll never say no. It's not that I don't have sensual desires. I just love God more and I say no to the porn. I say no to the adultery. I say no to the fornication so I can say yes to God. Are there any lovers of God here or online or in Arizona or Pomona or the world? In John 14, 15, it says this. If you love me, you'll obey my commandments. Jesus was straight up. Stop saying you love me and you don't do what I tell you to do. How can you say you love me and you only do what your sexual desires and your lust ask you to do? When drinking tells you let's drink a little bit, you're like, let's go. Your wife tells you to go to church, you say, ah, oh, nah. Your buddies say, man, let's, let, let, come on, man, I got some good stuff for you tonight. We're going to have a good time. You're like, I'm in. Let's go to a Bible study. I don't think so. And it's all because of the God that you serve. The God that you serve will determine the places you go, the things you get involved with. But there's a time that God converts you from a lover of pleasure to a lover of God. And it changed your desire. It changes your locations. It changed your friends. And it changes your habit. Come on, let's give God some praise that we can be an ex-lover of pleasure and a pleaser of God. Two attributes of a society that loves pleasure more than loves God. Two attributes. Attribute number one, a sexually unrestrained society. A society that loves pleasure, a person that loves pleasure more than God, is sexually, has no, has no sexual restraint. Some of us in this room, you have no sexual restraint. The reason you're not committing adultery right now is because there's no one offering themselves to you quite yet. You're looking for an opportunity. I'm being faithful. You're being faithful because nobody's right now checking in on your, come on, on your website. There, there's nobody checking you out. And you're, there's no one saying yes right now. But the first yes, you're jumping in because you're looking for an opportunity to worship your pleasure. See, I don't know if you're really a worshiper of God until an opportunity presents itself. Sexually unrestrained. It is God's will that we practice sexual restraint as believers. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, look what it says. God's will is for you to be holy. You know what that means? You wholly belong to God. You're 100% sold out to God. You've separated yourself for God. Those are choices that you make. You're not asking your flesh to jump in. You're telling your flesh what to do. And you're saying, right now, we're going to cut the porn. We're going to cut the adultery. We're going to cut the fornication. And we're going to practice sexual restraint so we can be lovers of God, not lovers of pleasure. Well, we're going to get married anyway. Stop justifying your fornication. Premarital sex is called fornication. Well, I love her. No, you love your pleasure. You don't love her. 
if you love her, you'd say, we're going to wait till we get married because I'm going to, because I want to make sure this marriage is built on a good foundation. And if right now you're saying, nah, we're just doing our thing. We love the pleasure. It's time to repent of it and serve God. God will forgive you. You'll have a brand new start and you can become a lover of God. Only lovers of God are going to heaven. God's will is for you to be holy. And this is how he says it. So stay away from all sexual sin. Then each of you will control his body. Each one of us should control our body. Lust shouldn't control our body. Sex shouldn't control our body. We control our body. I've given you my Holy Spirit so you can be holy. And I'm giving you power to restrain yourself. You are not an animal. You've been created in my image and you could overcome every sinful, lustful, sensual desire. I give you the power to say yes to me and no to your flesh. Not in lustful passion. Again, it says it. It's God's will that we not live in lustful passion like pagans who don't know God and his ways. Now check this out. It begins to identify the two groups. Pagans are non-believers, and they don't restrain themselves. They're just looking for the next hookup. They're on a date site, and it's like a rotating sex club. Even Christians right now are on websites, and they're hooking up sexually. And this is the rotation that they're in. I'm sorry. God, forgive me until next Friday. Don't fool yourself. You're a lover of pleasure. You're not a lover of God. You have a form of godliness, but you're denying the power thereof that can make you holy. I hope you could hand, I mean, I'm just saying, I hope you come back next week. Now, I, I understand this. I love you. And I, I'm just preaching the word of God. Come on. We need to hear the pure word of God so we can start living a holy life. God has not changed his standard. He's saying, I'm looking for some people that worship me in spirit and in truth. Some people that really love me, not just with their mouths, but they love me with their bodies. The sexual revolution has led us to a sexually unrestrained society. Sexual revolution. Some of you guys are too young to even know there was a sexual revolution. It's history. In the 60s and the 70s, there was a sexual revolution. It was a movement in the 60s and 70s. It was an actual movement with, in developed countries it was like a 20-year span of redefining sex. This is what it was. And this is Wikipedia. I didn't make this stuff up. The sexual revolution, also known as a time of sexual liberation, that means not sexual restraint, let's take all the restraints off and let's get liberated, was a social movement that challenged traditional codes of behavior related to sexuality and interpersonal relations throughout the United States and the developed world from the 60s to the 70s. Sexual liberation included increased acceptance of sex outside of traditional heterosexual monogamous relationships, primarily, primarily marriage. There was understanding that sex belonged in a marriage. Even those that were not, that were participating in sex out of marriage, there was an understanding, I'm sinning. But after the sexual revolution, we no longer looked at it as a sin. We looked at it as liberation. I am now free without any straight restraints, guilt trips, who cares what God says. I am free to indulge and sleep with who I want to sleep with and just enjoy my pleasure. One night stands, 
fine. No commitment, fine. It doesn't matter if I have a sexual transmitted disease. Who cares? If they're willing to sleep with me, that's their problem. Look at this. The normalization is what happened of contraception and the pill, public nudity, pornography, premarital sex, homosexuality, masturbation, alternative forms of sexuality, and the legalization of abortion all followed. Now, why would there be a legalization of abortion? Because if we have a sexual revolution with everyone is having sex without any restraint, this is what's going to happen. We're going to have a whole bunch of unplanned pregnancies. And we got to do something about them. Because it's messing up my life. I wanted to have sex, but I don't want a kid. I don't want responsibility. And for me to have this baby right now, it's going to mess up my career. It's going to mess up my college. It's going to mess up my, it's just not going to make me feel like, like, uh, like I'm really available. I don't want to be taking care of a kid. Nah. Let's go ahead and with the sexual revolution, let's add in an abortion revolution. So we can take care of the consequence. So one sin is leading to another sin. And you say, Pastor, we're going that far to call it a sin. Right now we are. We'll go deeper into it, why it is. You don't have to be convinced of the sin quite yet. Attribute number two of a, of a, of a, of a, 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 a society that loves pleasure and love, rather than loves God, unwanted pregnancies and abortion. Every year, in America, 3 million women in the U.S. will face an unplanned pregnancy. And of those, 43% will end an abortion, which is 1.3 million a year in the U.S. Just imagine, just imagine this, if there was a, a city that was wiped out, 1.3 million just wiped off the face of the earth. It'd be all over the news. But yet we're living in a society that abortion is celebrated. The reason it's celebrated because we're lovers of pleasure. And this allows us to continue in our pleasure and eliminate the consequence. Abortion is just this. I choose me over a child. Getting quiet in here. I'm telling you, this is a tough subject, but, but understand, we're not covering the subject to put anybody else down because, of course, there's people that have had abortions here, but it doesn't matter what you've done. God will forgive you and set you free if you just admit, I was wrong. That's okay. We've all done wrong. And there's a God that will cleanse you, restore you, and heal you, and set you free from all the depression and the shame and addiction that came with it. It doesn't make you especially bad if you had an abortion. It just makes you a sinner like all of us. In the, United, in the world, there's 121 million unintended pregnancies. How is this happening? Unintended? When you have sex, you could have get pregnant. This is basic biology. But the problem is, that's not the issue. I am being led by my pleasures, so I don't care about the consequences. I'll just eliminate them if they come up. 121 million. Check this out. There's 73 million abortions a year. You know what that means? 200,000 a day. San Bernardino has 200,000 people approximately. It's like a city that's being eliminated like San Bernardino every day for our pleasure. The big question, is abortion murder? That's the question. Because if it's not, it doesn't really matter. It is not murder if it is just a removal of a clump of cells that has no soul. If it is not a person with a soul, it is nothing more than removing a cancerous growth 
If it is a person with a soul, it is taken a life. Number two, it is not murder if there's not another body involved. But if there is a separate body from the mother, no matter how small the body might be, if we remove or kill or exterminate the body, it might be a small body, but it is a body and we're killing it. Illustration, I, I, I was looking up about, about illustration the other day and I found this. In, this, in 12 3 21, December 3rd, 21, a man, Nikea Jackson, charged with double murder after he shot and killed a pregnant woman, Ashanti Smith, which was his girlfriend. The question is why is it considered double homicide if the pregnant woman is murdered? Because the law does recognize that the unborn does have a life and deserves to live. It's crazy. Faulty logic. Say it with me, faulty logic. It is a grown baby if I want it. And it is not a baby with a life if I don't want it. Faulty logic. There's couples that have been doing everything to get pregnant. And when they get pregnant, they say this, we're having a baby. But when we don't want it, we don't call it a baby. We just call it cells. Now, this is what Christians believe about life. And I think if you have any sense of morality, you're going to say, I agree with that list. Three things we believe about life. Christians believe, these are followers of Christ, that all people have inherent dignity and immeasurable value. How many believe that people have value? In Matthew 10, 31, Jesus said this, you, beloved, are worth so much more than a whole flock of sparrows. God knows everything about you. Even the numbers of your hairs are on your head. So do not fear. God is saying, I love you so much and you're measurably, measurably val valuable to me that I even know how many hairs you have on your head. I love you. Value. Say, God loves me. We also believe that the value of a life is not determined by its usefulness or stage of development. So we're not saying you're worth more because you're smarter. You're worth more because you're more able. We don't say you're worth more because you're more useful to me. You're worth more because you're more developed. We don't believe that. We don't believe that a baby is worth less because it's not fully developed like you. We don't believe someone that right now that's struggling to live and right now is in a hospital and they may be in a coma. We don't say you're worth nothing. You're valuable. We're not saying that a poor person that doesn't look like they're contributing to society or a criminal is worth nothing. We believe that every single person is worth it. And they have a measurable value. And God loves them and will do everything we can to save them. Christians believe that God is the creator and giver of all life. And Job 33, 4 says, For the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of Almighty, Almighty gives me life. So we're, this is what we believe, that God made us. And I'm alive because he put breath in my lungs. The reason I'm alive is because he has put life in me. The life came from my creator. I have a soul. I'm alive. I am alive even if I don't have a body, I'm alive. So now, what does science say about when life begins? We cannot ignore what science has discovered about life. We cannot leave out, we leave it up to a woman, society, to determine when life begins. There are irrefutable facts about which there is no dispute in the scientific community when life begins. So let's talk about 
Let's talk about science. There is proof of life at conception. The earliest form of life is when a sperm is joined with an egg. And that's called a zygote. At that moment, when a human sperm penetrates a, a, this is science, a human ovum or egg, generally in the upper portion of fallopian tube, a new entity, something that has real existence, body, a new creature, individual, comes into existence. The zygote is the name of the first cell formed at conception, the earliest development stage of the human embryo. There's a question. Is a zygote human? Is it alive? Or is it just a cell? Or is it an organ, organism? The new human zygote has a genetic composition that is absolutely unique in itself. So as soon as the egg, I mean the sperm penetrates the egg, this zygote is unique all by itself different from any other human that has ever existed. The zygote is composed of a human DNA that has never existed in human history. It is undeniably human and not some other species. The first thing, it's not a dog. It's the beginning of human development. And it has its own DNA. You know what that means? When we're eliminating a zygote, an embryo, a fetus, this is what we're eliminating. We're eliminating a separate DNA. So the mother can't say it's my body that I'm eliminating. No, you're not eliminating your body. You're eliminating another body that has a separate, unique DNA. Science. Let's look at this video. I want to show you. And this is a video which is so unique. It shows us when, when the sperm penetrates the egg, there's a light that sparks. And this is what the Bible says about light. I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but I but have the light of life. This is what's happening as soon as the sperm hits the egg, there's a light. And you know what that means? As soon as it happens, there's a life. There's a soul. Come on. That's when the light and the life enters. Take a look at this. See if you can see it. Oh, why isn't it on the center screen? You guys see that? As soon as it penetrates, boom! Life. Because God is the light of life. <laughs> Scientific. Proof of humanity in early stages of development. Human beings develop in an astonishingly rapid pace. Given a quick... Given a quick look at it, the cardiovascular system is the first major system to function. At about 22 days, the heart has a pulse. Twenty-two days. Let's take a look at this video, and this video is right around eight weeks into it, but you can hear the pulse of this little baby's heart at just 22 days. Look at this. I mean, at, at, at eight weeks. That is a little human.
In just six weeks, the child's eyes and eyelids, nose, mouth, tongue are formed. From early as 12 weeks, an unborn child can feel pain. Medicine, too, confirms the existence of chi a child before birth as a distinct human person. Fetal surgery. Have you ever heard of fetal surgery? That they actually do a surgery on the fetus? Fetal surgery has become a medical specialty and includes the separate provision of anesthesia to the baby because it's a different entity. Isn't that interesting? So now let's look at what the Bible says about abortion and life. Number one, the miracle of a child being conceived and the process of development is a work of God. God takes credit for it. Children are a miracle. They cannot be recreated in laboratories. They need an egg and they need a sperm and then God does a miracle of development. In Job 31, 15, it says, did not the one who made me in the womb also make them? Did not the same God form us both in the womb? How interesting that the word doesn't call it an it, but it gives personal pronouns. It says me and us and them. It's describing people. So God calls them people while they're being formed still. God acknowledges a person, us as a person, with purpose while we're formless. In Psalms 139, 16, your eyes saw me when I was formless. All the days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. God is saying, when I look at a formless, what looks formless, I see a person and I have a plan for them. They're not an accident. Come on, God has a plan for your life. I know your mom said you're an accident, a mistake, but God says you're not. Before you were formed, I already had a plan for your life. Let's give God some praise that you're not an accident and God has a plan. Let's live according to God's plan. Number two, even before conception, what? God identifies as a human male or female with a purpose. Now, this is way deep now. God is saying before you were even conceived or your mom and dad got you pregnant, I already knew you. You were a soul before you were a zygote. You were a soul before you were ever conceived. You were a soul definitely before you were born. That's crazy. Before Manoah's wife is pregnant, God identifies his gender. Look at this. In Judges 13, 3, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and said, You have not been able to have children. But look at this. You, but you will become pregnant. You'll become what? You're not pregnant yet. Look what it says. And have a son. I already know what's coming to you. I know what's coming your way before you were born because I've already identified a son for you, a soul I'm attaching to you. And the gender was picked before the doctors could figure out what gender you were. That's why there's a fight for gender because what the enemy wants to do, he wants to give you a gender that God never gave you because he wants to be the God of your life and he wants to define you and he wants to undefine what God is saying about you and God is saying, no, I made you a female, I made you a male before your mom and dad got pregnant. God knew us before we were conceived in our mother's womb. I knew you before you were even conceived. You were a soul, a spirit, way before you ever were a person on earth. Look at this. In Jeremiah 1.5, I knew you before I formed your mother's womb. I already knew you.
because I'm the alpha, I'm the omega, I'm the beginning and the end, I'm the future, I'm the past, I'm the present. I already knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet. How far did God choose us? God chose us and knew us before the creation of earth. You were a person. So when were you a person? Before the earth was created, you were a person. So for sure, at a zygote, you were a person. Ephesians 1, 4 says, even in his love, he chose us, actually picked us out for himself as his own in Christ. Before the foundations of the world, you were a person. That's crazy. The unborn soul in scripture responds to Christ. In Luke 1 40, this is, this is a baby. She went into Zachariah's house and it greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the unborn baby inside of her jumped and she was filled with the Holy Spirit. What jumped? A body didn't jump, a soul jumped. Responding to Jesus. Mary was pregnant, Elizabeth was pregnant, but Mary was pregnant with Jesus. Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist. And when Mary just walked in the room, that spirit that knows God, recognized God, and soon as God entered that room, even though he was in her tummy, the baby began to jump because the soul recognized the creator. Come on, give God some praise. This is some real deep stuff. I will end it with this. Child sacrifice was practiced in the Old Testament as an act of worship to their false gods of pleasure. So this is not a new, a new thing. It's an old thing that was rolled out thousands of years ago. And I always call this, it's a, it was a soft, a, a soft opening. To, re, to re-bring those gods back in the last days and establish them until the Antichrist comes. The Antichrist right now is excited because all the bloodshed that we're given to him as we're worshiping and as we're sacrificing for the worship of our God of pleasure. And he says, I love this. You are ushering in my presence, my power and my death and my destruction and my deception. Thank you. We are not the first generation to sacrifice our children for the love of pleasure and riches. We're living in a time where we are seeing the return of ancient gods. And God calls it murder. In Deuteronomy 12, 31, you must not worship the Lord. You know, you must not worship the Lord, your God, the way the other nations worship their gods. For they perform for their gods every detestable act that the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters as sacrifices to their gods. What he's saying is don't try to be like the world. You cannot be a Christian and be for abortion. Can't do it. If you're a Christian that's for abortion, you are, I want you to understand this. You are saying, I could care less when life begins. I serve my pleasure and I worship like the people of this world. And understand this, you are not worshiping God. You're worshiping a God in your own image that you created. Psalms 106, 37, they even sacrifice their sons and their daughters to demons. They shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters. By sacrificing them to idols of Canaan, they polluted the land with murder. Sacrificing their children for this God called Baal or Moloch. Baal or Moloch. Say with me, Baal or Moloch. There's an actual demon named Molech and Baal, and that spirit, if there was like a resurrection, it was always here, but it's an ancient spirit that's right now resting in our society, and we're offering them our children. Baal and Molech, let's look at this. It was a fertility god that was worshipped, which involved sex orgies. Sex orgies. 
we're going to talk about it in church? Of course we're going to talk about that in church because right now the devil is making us a, 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 a society that loves pleasure and we're bringing pleasure, come on, into, into our bedrooms that God forbids and he calls detestable. And even through the porn, you're committing orgies. They worship an idol which was in the shape of an enlarged male sex organ, an Asherah pole. Temple prostitutes supported the temple worship of Baal. Its worship was filled with perversion, homosexuality, immorality, sexual promiscuity. The cult of Moloch is said to have boiled children alive in the bowels of of a big bronze statue with the body of a man and the head of a bull. Baal seeks to get God's children to spiritually divorce themselves from God and enter a covenant with him, that is, to marry him. He wants us to pull away from God, to bow down to him through our love and of pleasure for pleasure and money. Baal goes after our children. Child sacrifice was part of the deal. Could this possibly be the spirit behind abortions and child abuse that runs rampant in the U.S.? It's something to think about. I, we're going to end it with this. Let's take a look at Baal, a picture of him. Let's look at it. This is Baal. This is the God that they worship. But look at what's in his belly. It's a furnace. And they would take the babies and put them in the furnace. What this was a prophetic look at what would happen in the future. Back in those days, they didn't have the technology to kill the baby in the belly. But it would be set up that we would put them in the belly. But in this century, we'd have an ability to sacrifice our children in the belly. It's not a new spirit. It's an old one. And the price for child sacrifice in those days was death. If any of them offer their children, in Leviticus 20 verse 5, if any of them offer their children as, as, as a sacrifice to Molech, they must be put to death. That's verse 2 actually. So what do we do? <laughs> it's getting all serious in here. You guys learned something today, though. Now, what do we do? This, lot, this, this is what we do. And Isaiah 1.18 says, come, let's talk this over, says the Lord. No matter how deep the stain of your sins are, I can take it out and make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. And if you, even if you are stained as red as crimson, I'll make you white as wool. It doesn't matter. My wife, before she met me, had an abortion. And what is she going to do? But come to Jesus and receive forgiveness. That's it. Now, after she receives forgiveness, she gets totally restored. God says, I got a plan for you. You're going to be a pastor's wife. You guys are going to pastor a church that's going to reach the world. And that abortion is not going to disqualify you. Come on. Your mistakes are not going to disqualify you. Because when I sent my son to die for you, he covers not a sin that I can't forgive you. And now what I'm going to do, remember, before you were born, I already had a plan. We're going to do that plan. God loves you. He loves you. Let's all stand up. You guys are an amazing crowd. We covered a lot of stuff in a half hour or so. I thought this was, I told one of the guys back there, one of the pastors, like, you know, this is like a college course I'm trying to teach in a half hour. It should be taught in two hours. But how many did we, how many, did we learn something? Okay. And, and the teachers that we're receiving right now, understand, I'm not Googling them, trying to find them somewhere. This is God downloading these teachings. Never heard them before in my life. And God's given us revelation. So we could fight against, not people, fight against the spirit that's trying to usher in an antichrist spirit. 
And all we're saying right now, we're in warfare. We're going to intercede. We're going to pray for our state. Right now, California is an abortion um, sanctuary. And what they're saying is, if your state doesn't, doesn't allow you to have an abortion, we'll pay for you to fly here and we'll do the abortion here for you. So we're literally saying, we don't care what God says. We don't care what's right or wrong. Right now, we're saying as, a Cal, as California, we welcome the murder of children and babies and people and lives. All abortion is, is stopping development of a human being. Understand, if you don't arrest the development, a baby's coming that's going to grow into a kid, a person that God has a plan for. And even if it was dire situation, you're in, I don't know how I'm going to do it. And you might be struggling with that decision today, man. I got pregnant, it's embarrassing. I don't want to tell my mom. I don't want to tell my dad. Um, but God says, I know. But even though it was your mistake, it's not my mistake. This child is going to be a blessing to you and to the world. I'm going to give you an opportunity to raise this child for me. And my plans are good and not evil for that child. We, we got to make sure that we're not a church or a society in the church that we penalize people that get pregnant and go through the process. There's other people that are right now, they're really good at covering up their fornication and sexual morality and they make sure they have contraception and they're doing it and they're hiding it. But it doesn't mean they're any better than anybody else. Now, if someone does get pregnant, what we're going to do is support them. Young lady, come on, ladies, we're not going to dog them. We're going to say, baby, come on, we've all been there. Let's get through this together, and we're going to help you as a village to raise this child for God, and we're going to make sure this child, but I can't have it. And you might be saying, I can't take care of it. You might not, but there's going to be a family that could take care of that baby, and they're going to raise them for God, and we're going to be part of their solution. Come on, how many understand? It's not hard. It's not easy. It's just hard. But we do it because we love God. Okay? So today, we're, gonna, we're just going to pray. If, if I'm, not, I'm not picking you out. If you had an abortion come up, I'm not doing that. But I, I'm going to tell you this. If you have, God's not mad at you. And if you think like the devil, oh, man, you, the devil, um, God knows what I did. He doesn't love me. God says, What? You're listening. Not only you get the devil, the devil to talk you into what you did, but the devil's still talking you, talking to you. God says, "I love you." Though your sins be red as crimson, I'll make you white as snow. Come on, come. I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to cleanse you. I'm here to give you your life back, your future back. And you gotta be forgiven because if you don't get forgiven, you live under a guilt trip. And what you do is sabotage your own success. Be Deep down in the back of your head, you're thinking, I don't deserve a good man. I don't deserve a good life. I don't deserve a blessing. And you sabotage yourself and you're not even thinking about it. You just do it. Stop it. Stop it. God loves you. He forgives you. It's okay. It doesn't matter. He already knew and he sent his son for you. He loves you. All God's son to forgive you, cleanse you, and restore the plan he has for you. But if you're saying, Pastor, I didn't, it was an abortion, but I want forgiveness of my sins today. Maybe you say, I've been living for pleasure. It might, not be, it might just not be but sexual morality, but it might be sexual morality and drinking and smoking and pot and porn. And you're just like in it. And you're thinking, I know when I get in it, it feels good while I do it temporarily. But after, I feel guilty, I feel dark, and I feel unworthy. And I'm thinking, what am I doing? And I feel like I'm getting darker, going dark, deeper into the darkness. There's things I'm attracted to that I would, never would have been attracted to. But it's like, a, it's like a bottomless pit of darkness. And I keep going and I tell myself, I got to stop. This is not a good example for my kids, my family, my mind. It's hurting me. And I want to be forgiven. I don't care what the pleasure is. But understand this. If you're not a lover of God, you're a lover of pleasure. That's it. But there has to be a day that you say, I repent of my pleasure so I can live for God. 
And God will change your heart when you're ready to do that. If today you want forgiveness and you want eternal life and you want freedom, come on, you want God to give you a new life, it's a choice. Don't reject him. He's knocking at your heart's door. This is your time to give your life to Jesus. Jesus will come in. He'll set you free. He'll make you new. And he'll fill you with his life. Today could be your brand new day. Bring your anxiety. Bring your depression. Bring your shame. Bring your past. Come on. Let's erase it right now. Tonight's your night to get it erased and get filled with God's spirit. If that's you, come forward right now. Come on. If you feel like God's talking to me and I need to surrender something to God. I want to give it all up to God today. I want forgiveness. I'm making up my mind. I'm no longer serving pleasure. Come on. You can't get set free from something you're hiding. Come on. You can't get set free from something you're saying, ah, oh, it's not a problem, but you know it's a problem. Someone needs to come up today and finally get set free. Come on, of this passion, these sensual desires that are taking it away from God. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Someone's coming up. Someone's getting a new start. You might say, I need, I, man, I, could, I, I did do an abortion. I want forgiveness. Come on up. I was part of an abortion. Come on up. I told my daughter to get an abortion. Come on up. It's okay. I messed up. There's someone that had an abortion and you've been having a hard time getting pregnant. And God's not only going to forgive you, he's going to heal your womb. Come on and give you your life back. Come on. He's going to allow you to be fruitful again. It was a curse that was put on you. God's going to remove the curse today. And you're married. And you're married. I just want to make sure you know that. Come on, church. Are you excited? Come on, that we're covering these subjects. Next week's going to be good. We're going to do our 30-day challenge. I'm going to just one more time. One more time. It's your day. If you've been worshiping pleasure, it's time to surrender. It's never going to end. Don't, don't say one more time around. There might not be another time around. It might be your last shot. Today's your day. Be saved. Be forgiven. Come. Come with your adultery. Come with your, your addiction. Come on, come with, the, come with the anger. Come with the unforgiveness. Come on, come, come, just come with the shame. Come. You're not going to leave the same way you came. Come on. Come on, there's still people coming. Let's give the Lord a hand. Someone said it. So, come on, God is setting people free. Come on, people are still coming, church. We're not here to play games. Come on, we're setting people free. Hallelujah. Proud of you, baby. Come on. We're breaking the power of the devil right now. Okay. Get filled with the spirit. It's okay. If you have a porn addiction, you got to come up. There has to be a day you're finally done with the porn. I, I'm just telling you this. You can't wait till your flesh says, okay, we're done. Your flesh will never say we're done. But there has to be a day that you say, I'm done, and I'm breaking the power of that thing. I'm making a decision. God set me free. And then I'm going to hang around some believers. I'm going to go to holy warriors, and I'm going to break this thing. Come on. Every, come on. Every man especially. Come on. Men and women. But a man, we got to break this thing. It'll mess you up. Okay, making sure we're breaking it. We're no longer going to worship pleasure. We're going to worship God. But I'm going to give you this one statement. I'm going to pray. The, God says this, in my presence, God says, God says, in my presence are pleasures forevermore. God wants you to have pleasure, but he doesn't want you to worship forbidden pleasure. He goes, I want you to get addicted to my pleasure. Come on. Serving God is pleasing. Come on. There's a lot of pleasure serving God. And it's a good pleasure because it doesn't leave you the hangover. doesn't leave you messed up. Shame, trying to cover up stuff. Lying, cheating. It's over. Let's pray. Let's pray. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I thank you that before I was born, you knew me. You called me. You loved me. You chose me. I'm not a mistake. I'm not an accident. I'm asking you now to save me 
Forgive me. Set me free from the past, from shame, from addiction. Set me free from depression, anxiety, and fill me now with your love, with your forgiveness. I plead your blood. Cleanse me now of all sin. I renounce my devotion to the God of pleasure to serve you. You're my Lord. You're my Savior. You love me so much that you sacrificed your life so that I could be forgiven and made brand new. I'm saved. I'm forgiven. And I am now a child of God a disciple of Jesus Christ and your plan will be fulfilled in my life thank you Jesus in Jesus name I pray amen come on church we love you Sunday's gonna be awesome you don't want to miss it we're gonna have 30 day journals you're gonna be able to purchase this Sunday you do not want to miss it 30 days. I'm gonna, it's almost like I'm sitting down with you. We're going to have Bible studies every single day. It's going to be awesome. If you need prayer for healing, breakthrough, come on up. We got a team that's going to pray with you. Everyone here, come on. It's time to get release it. For, receive forgiveness. Forgive yourself. Get filled with the Spirit and take your next step. Holy Wars 1, 2, 3, baptism. Take your next step. We love you. God bless you, church. Love you guys so much. Let's keep going forward.